Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon went out for a hike on April the 1st, 2014. Ten weeks later, their possessions will be found. Just over a week after the girl's rucksack was found, the search team started finding their remains, and the dreams of them ever returning home will be shattered. Where did the investigation lead the authorities? And finally, what is the most probable scenario? Was what happened on their trip to Panama an accident, or have the girls met foul play? This is the story of the lost girls of Panama. Are you ready to go down the rabbit hole with me? You sound like a really bad country impersonator who is also about to have their last breath on Earth. Listen, I'm sick, okay? Deal with it. I'm gonna sound differently than I usually sound in my videos. I'm gonna look like death, so I'm gonna try to put as many pictures and videos into this one so that you avoid this whole situation. What I'm not going to do is try to pretend like I'm a victim, because there's only one spot for a person like that in this story. And Betsy, Betsy's gonna take it. You're gonna meet Betsy soon. You're gonna not love her, hopefully. So just a heads up, this is my voice for the day, and also this part is probably gonna be split in two, but I plan to release both parts on the same day, just to try to break them up, because it's faster for YouTube to upload, I can then put like more images and videos into every single part, and also because some of you are complaining that two our long videos are too hard on you. You can't focus and videos shouldn't be two hours long unless I'm in direct contact with God, passing the God's message. Yeah, don't bring God into this story, please. Please, because uh, we wouldn't be here, something tells me, if, you know, the big J was in any way, shape, or form involved. The way I plan to split the rest of this story is for part three to contain the investigation of it, so to recap the main points that we already covered in part one and two, and then to continue with the timeline of what happened beyond April the 11th. That will include some parts from this book, and you are going to meet the prosecutor, the main prosecutor in this case, and learn how she perceives this story, which should be facts, but it's a lot less factual than it is. And then you can do the whole Game of Thrones, you know, liar, liar, chanting as Cersei is walking down the streets of Dubrovnik naked. It's a beautiful city, by the way. You should definitely visit the spot where that happened. But I think it's important because it is the only official information that we have on this case, and because from that point on, we are going to take it apart. So we are going to speak about where the case was shot, where the investigation was closed, and why possibly it shouldn't have been. Like, all of the questions that people have, all of the holes that people poke in this story, and then we are going to talk about the suspect. Although I would say this story, based off of, like, the cases, the US, UK cases that I've covered, that people we're gonna talk about in this story have never even properly reached the suspect level. They are treated as suspects by mostly the public opinion, but I'd say the most they have reached, if we are to compare it to, like, US justice system, would be person of interest. At most. So we're gonna talk about those people, about what they witnessed, why they're suspicious, have they ever been investigating, where does that stand now? With that, we are going to finalize the part of the investigation and move on to part four, which will be just theories. There, I will give you a breakdown of the factual evidence, and then we are going to discuss the theories. So, the accident, getting lost theory, and then all the possibilities towards foul play. That being said, I understand that all of the possibilities might give you, like, super high expectations. Even if I was to make 20-hour videos, like, multiple 20-hour videos on this topic, I still wouldn't be able to cover it all. So, if you believe I have, A, missed out on something crucial that would bring 
the solution that will bring this case to the close, put it in the comments. I can make one huge pin comment with like actual factual information that I either missed out, that people believe would actually really fit one or the other theories. And also, let's try in part three and part four to actually back it up. Like if you have a link as to where you read something like that, if you have any official documents, well, A, send them my way, but also, yes, send me the link to those. Because that is something that we are truly lacking in this story. The official police documents. I'd like to believe that the families have them, that the writers of this book and different blog posts did have them as well. And if you have them, because I couldn't find them online, send them my way. I will make another video, I will make an appendix to this whole story. But... I think it's important here, the same way that I put screenshots of what I'm talking about to back it up, and that I will be telling you, you know, if it's from the book, if it's from Scarlett's blog, YouTube channel, if it's from Lost in the Wild documentary, if it is from the Imperfect Plan blog, from Chris's blog, to know the fact from fiction here, and for us to all question our biases by the end of this story. To know that, is it just because we conjured it up in our mind? Is it because we read it on Reddit? Or are we actually basing our conclusions and theories on the factual evidence, as limited as it is? That's another reason why I'm splitting it, because in my perfect world, this comment section on this video is going to just be based on the investigation, maybe the gaps, maybe the information that you have that I didn't include, and then we can discuss the investigation, we can discuss and focus on the suspects, on the prosecution, on how botched or not botched the investigation was. And then in the next part, which I'm super excited for, and that's why I'm gonna record it tomorrow, because hopefully I feel better, I look better, I can be like 200% in there, I'm going to also let you in on my thought process when I think of mystery cases, when I think of the cases that have been unsolved, because... You might be familiar with it if you have watched a single other video of mine that, you know, is kind of like suspicious, death, mysterious death. I am a list lover. Every time when I'm in doubt, I whip out a list. I do the pros, I do the cons, and then, in this case, there was a third column of all of the information that we need in order to make conclusions. So, in part four, I'm going to go a step further, and if you are up for a final challenge, only if you're super serious about this, please, there will be a Google Doc in the pinned comment in part 4 for you to test this out. Any theory that you have ever thought of, any theory that you would put your hand into fire that is correct, that has most probably happened in this case, run it by that free column list and run it by a flow to see where in that story do you have to start making up different bits to it. Where in this story do you have to struggle to start asking questions? And up until what point does it actually flow? And then, based off of that, you will probably see that it's not as black and white, as you think, and that there are stories and possibilities that flow better versus the others. But that is for part four, and just one last bit before we actually dive in. Because I have watched so many things on this, and have obviously read the comments on certain videos and the Reddit posts, be respectful. That Google Doc right now is open for everybody to edit. It might not remain that way. Their friends of Chris and Lisan, their family members, friends of family members that are watching these videos, that are looking for different theories, different possibilities. So only fill that shit out if you're serious. And any negative comments towards any of the families, any negative bullshit kind of theories on that sheet that are offensive towards them, I'm removing it, I'm removing the access to everybody to the sheet, I am not gonna tolerate any, any of that. So just bear in mind that whatever you put in the comments under this video, no matter that I am 
a small creator that I don't have as many people watching it as some YouTube people might have, people can see it. Family members can see it, their friends can see it. So just bear that in mind and be respectful in the comments in part 3 and part 4 especially when we go down the rabbit hole. But now let us go through a timeline. The main points so far and then let's move on from there to see what else has been done during this investigation. On the 1st of April, around 1.54 p.m., we know that the picture 508 would be taken. It would be taken by a stream that people presumed it is around one hour down the other side of the summit, going towards the Continental Divide and heading away from Boquete, from the city. On the 2nd of April, the tour guide Feliciano and Eileen, the intern, go to their host family house. Miriam wasn't there and she hasn't reported the girls missing yet because she just thought that they were going to return. But they never did. So eventually, on that day, they have been reported missing. According to Betsaida, the public prosecutor, Sinaprok had no choice but to start searching all of the tourist sites. On April the 8th, a letter was sent to Movistar, which is the telecom provider in Panama, and there was a request for it in the police file, according to the book. They asked this telecom provider if, on the April the 1st, the cell phones of Chris and Lisan were active, and which antenna received the signals from them. And it resulted, according to the public prosecutor's office, in nothing for Sinaprok to hold on to. On April the 10th, the police took the belongings of Chris and Lisan from the bedroom of Miriam Guerra's house. Among these belongings, they're going to find a piece of paper, a business card, if you wish. It kind of looks to me like a piece of paper, not really a business card, with... Feliciano's information on it, with the details to the tours that he runs, which will lead to further speculations down the line of whether this is why he went to Miriam's house with Eileen in order to plant this information. I'll we'll speak about that in the suspect section of the video. Four days after this, so April the 14th, Betsaida was put on the case. During that period, the police went to all of the hostels in Boquete, according to her, to ask if Chris and Lizanne had been seen there, or if any of the guests were in contact with them in the days that were leading up to the disappearance. But they got no information, like nobody recognized them, and nobody knew where they had gone. By this point, according to the data from the phones and the cameras, girls already missed the tour with a guide on the second. I couldn't find any information that he was immediately questioned, that Eileen was immediately questioned. According to multiple blogs, Eileen actually left to go back to Germany only five days after April the 2nd which is a weird way of saying April the 7th, but that is what I found online, again sparking more and more theories on why would she leave in the middle of an investigation, or rather how was she allowed to leave? Wasn't she one of the crucial people to actually be questioned, maybe possibly even treated as a person of interest? And from the information that we know now, after the rucksacks have been found, we know that there was a pattern in phone usage that led people to believe that this was Chris and Lisan who established this pattern on when to switch the phones off every day and when to switch them back on. And already from the 5th of April, the PIN won't be entered on Chris's iPhone and Samsung phone would be dead. During those days, according to the book, Sinaprok also searched for one of their own people, Osman Valenzuela, who joined the search for Chris and Lisan on April the 4th. And they started searching for him because he hadn't returned that April the 4th. And that day, the weather already started being rough in the afternoon. Eventually, the next day at 12.50, Osman's body will be found under the bridge over the river Chiriquisito, and his dog was standing there barking. They have concluded that he had been drinking alcohol that day. 
that he returned to the river after a swim in order to pee, possibly, and that because of a strong current, he drowned, and then his body surfaced, and that's how they found him. We're gonna talk a bit more about Osman, because it relates to one specific foul play theory in part four, but there really isn't as much. Like, I don't want you to have your expectations high, and some of you will say that there is a reason why there isn't so much, but this is according to the prosecutor's office conclusions. Then, after the conversation with the Attorney General, Anna Belfon, and the Dutch ambassador, Wiebe de Boer, as chief prosecutor of Chiriki province, Betsaida asked the Pocete police to urgently send her a file that she received on April the 25th. Four days after that, so April the 29th, Betsaida personally picked up copies of the hard drives from the language school in both Pocete and Bocas. She requested further assistance from the Netherlands and from Germany, and in May and June that year, they were carrying out raids in different places, partly because after raising the reward of $30,000, they started receiving tips. So they had to go to fincas, to like the farms and sheds in the area, in order to raid them, to see if the girls are possibly held somewhere, because of all the kidnap theories. So let me loop you into this, because you probably have questions, and I have questions, and she doesn't give us fucking answers. This book, the Kindle version at least of it, was written in May, somewhere in the summer this year. That is why I wanted to read it, to see if there's anything else on this case that isn't out there on the internet. But Saida wrote like two or three chapters in this book. There's about 20 pages. I'm not going to give you my peace of mind on her right now. I'm gonna vent in the end of this whole timeline a bit. But you see, she keeps mentioning these things, but doesn't give any details. And that is a prevalent thing. Like, school files, okay, you would think like, what are we gonna find about them? Like, they use the computers in the school, which they have told us and I have included in part one. So was there anything else there? Did they Google more on El Pianista Trail? what resulted in those school files, and even more importantly, do we not have the logs of other people in order to support their timelines and their alibis, of Eileen, of Guy Def, of anybody in this story? Because that, then, you can say, in one line even, summarize it, say, this is what resulted from the school log files, and it has excluded people X, Y, Z. But we don't get that. By this point, in terms of the phone data, we know the night pictures have been taken on the night between the 7th and the 8th of April, early morning hours of the 8th, and the iPhone that Chris had was last used on the 11th of April. On the 14th, the search for the girls was already scaled down. Sinaproc stopped searching on this day, and Plinio Montenegro, the local guide, flied over the area with them one last time by a helicopter, and they found nothing, they saw nothing. The premise for this that was stated in the press conference was that if they were in the jungle of Boquete, we could have already found them. On the 30th of April, the reward would be raised from $2,500 to $30,000. And reason was that everybody was expecting by this point that a crime took place, otherwise the remains or the girls alive would have already been found. 35 new tips came in, but none would reveal where the women were. And then we have the interview by the Kramer's parents, Roeli and Hans, on May the 13th, 2014, where they discussed that reward of $30,000. Something that I couldn't find, and I'll tell you exactly in all this research where I had my gaps, so A, maybe I glitched, B, maybe there's just no information on it. And that is on the reward. Does anybody know if it's still set up, if people can still benefit of it? There's one particular reason in this whole story where you kind of are led to believe, like, is anybody still to profit out of it? If anybody knows, and if you know it from a viable source of information, let me know in the comments, and I'll definitely pin that information, because I don't think it is crucial. Like, if somebody was to come forward now, you gotta question their motives. Like, are they coming forward for the right reason, or is it because of a monetary gain?
During the interviews they had given in this time, Chris's and Lisanne's parents would say that they're not going anywhere as long as the fate of the daughters wasn't found out. In the public press conferences, Chris's parents said that they will stay here in Panama until they have been found. We will wait as long as it takes until you are found, and we will not give up. We will keep looking for you for as long as it takes. We will stay here. On May the 20th, according to Betsaida, the cabins by the Pianista area have been searched and no evidence was found leading to Chris and Lisanne. Then, on May the 22nd, following an anonymous tip, they raided an Italian restaurant that wasn't Il Pianista at 1.40 in the morning. The tip was that the two women were allegedly abducted from this place, but they found no evidence. Chris's dad, Hans, was also present during that raid. In the following days, they also reviewed the CCTV footage from Super 99, which is this store in Panama City, because, according to the witnesses, the two women bought food there on May the 12th and the 13th. But that tip didn't yield anywhere, it was then counted as a false tip. They went back to Movistar on May the 29th, conducting inspections on the phone providers of cable and wireless. They determined that there was no registration of cell phone traffic meaning that they were no incoming or outgoing calls. By this point, just bear in mind, the rucksack still hasn't been found with the phones in it. I don't know what to make out of it, because could they not have registered that they were outgoing calls? If that is the data that we have now, why couldn't it pick up on that? Was it because, well, there was no cell signal, or is it something else? The company Digicel pointed out to the prosecutor's office that the cell phones of Chris's had been active on April the 13th, but later, when they rechecked, the company reported back that this is not correct and that there was no phone traffic on that date. According to Betsaida, they followed up on all of the tips they received, but every time they ended up without a trace of the two women. Then, as we know in the story, the dogs will be sent from the Netherlands at the request of the Kramer's parents. And on Monday, May the 26th, the Dutch, with the National Police, with the Counterterrorism Unit, with Counter Narcotics, Firefighters, and Sinaproc, searched the tourist spots around Boquete with the dogs in hand but found no trace. Then, May the 29th, once again, the Pianista Trail on the Boquete side was inspected to the square inch, according to the book, and nothing had been found. They got a tip on June the 2nd that there was a Dutchman that lived in the area and might have been involved in the kidnapping of Chris and Lisanne. This was apparently an aggressive man with weapons at his home, here, because of that reason, they deployed the Dutch search dogs, but also they deployed police and the military. During the raid, one of Betsaida's people was apparently injured, but nothing had been found. There was another tip on June the 11th that a man in the Renascimento district allegedly kidnapped Chris and Lisanne. If this day rings a bell, it is because, as they were preparing to raid this man's finca, this man's house, they received a phone call that Lisanne's backpack was found somewhere deep in the jungle. They gave priority to that, and the tip resulted to be false. As we know, this is when the backpack would be found. We're gonna speak a bit more about this, because Betsaida, again, in the book, doesn't give a shit. She doesn't really explain why the backpack was only picked up two days later, on June the 13th. But this is where they flew by the helicopter to Alto Romero to pick it up from the people that found it. By 10 o'clock that day, she had the backpack and the standard procedure led to the inspection of the bag and its contents. And this is when they found the insurance card in the name of Lisanne Froon inside that led them to believe that this is the girl's backpack. Betsaida then wanted to see this place with her own eyes, so she asked the woman, Irma, that found the backpack, and her husband, Luis, how far it is from Alto Romero. They told her it would take about two hours to get there, and then two hours to get back to Alto Romero. 
it was only half past 10 in the morning, so they decided to go there with the whole team. National Police, Santa Front, Luis, Irma, and herself. They were walking in humidity, climbing in the muddy terrains, so they haven't made it until 3 o'clock to the river, and then on their way back, the ground was muddy. They couldn't even get up this hill just before Alto Romero on foot, they had to crawl, so they only arrived back at half past 10 in the evening, soaked and covered in mud. Because they were exhausted, that night they slept in their wet clothes on the wooden floor of the hut close together to keep warm, and then the next day she would take the statements from Irma and Luis. So this is June the 14th, 2014. The couple told her, among other things, that during the time of discovery they were working in the rice fields, a place that tourists don't go. We have kind of different information from most other sources, this is from the book, and I will poke holes at it a bit later in time. Then, the next day, so statements have been taken, the backpack has been taken and given to the forensics. The next day, they go back to David. She went to her husband and children in Panama City, as she does every weekend. Once there, her husband immediately took her to the hospital. She had a dehydration system, this is Bethsaida still, and she had them despite the fact that she was eating and drinking in the jungle. On June the 17th, they finally looked through the pictures on the camera and also on the phones. So the, you know, data and the calls are still being processed from what I'm led to believe, but finally they could determine that the women made it to El Mirador based on the pictures and also what they were wearing. So this is the first time that Petsaida realized Lisan only had a short dark pants and sleeveless green shirt, and that Chris was wearing the shorts and also the red and white striped t-shirt. That was crucial for the police at that time because they could discard a bunch of eyewitness statements based off what the girls were actually wearing. And it's good to do. You can then even have fallen in. But I don't that that only the bird is. Okay. Hold me out in a bit of fun. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to sleep. Yeah. But it is good to do. Yeah. Hello, Mingo. Yeah. 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 Maar dit is om uh, de plek waar om 1 uur die meiden foto's van elkaar hebben genomen. Het is top. Open plekje. Dan gaan we hier het pad weer verder naar beneden loopt. Ja, dat is geen... En dit is het pad waar we, waar we naar boven gekomen zijn. This is a little pub, little one? Uh, no, no. No pub? No, no. There's only... I finish here. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a tip area. This is my pub that you can name from here. And that's the pub that you can see on the camera. So they're going to go to the end of the road. There's still a photo made. A little bit further up. Immediately after the discovery of the backpack, they ordered a search Immediately after the discovery of the backpack, they ordered a search for additional remains on both sides of the bank of Rio Chinganoya. And on June the 18th, they will receive the tip that two shoes have been found, and one of them was including human remains. That call that they have received and was registered with the police was from a bunch of local tour guides, including Guide F, Feliciano Gonzalez, including Laureano, Angel, and Lorenzo, who discovered the two shoes, one of them with a foot inside. 
this group apparently was the one to call and was the one to have been searching because they were acting on behalf of the Kramer's family. This group of guys was apparently searching this area on behalf of Kramer's family. So there was this spokesperson for the Kramer's family, Jeroen Van Passel, and they'd be the one to ask the group to search for more remains and even pay them $150 to search it. Now, this particular information I could only find in the book. So, I'm not sure if that is because that is in the police records or is it correct. Angel, one of the people that found the foot, would say on Monday, June the 16th, that the group was searching along the banks of this river, and it's Changinola, Changinoya River, south of Alto Romero, when they smelled that intense odor of decomposing body. They found a shoe containing a sock and a foot laying behind a tree trunk in the leafage. Without the smell, they would have never been able to spot it. Moments later, so as Uncle here spots the shoe, Lorenzo spots the pelvic bone on the other side of the river. According to the book, he sees it in the water between two stones. He fishes it out with a piece of wood, and not knowing whether it is human or animal, he takes it along. The DNA chief, Diomedes Trejos, at the Panama Forensic Institute, went to David to check on the chain of custody, and he was the one to collect everything from these people. He then traveled with this discovery to Panama City. And on June the 19th, the Forensic Institute in Panama would receive a yellow envelope containing a brown left shoe that was described as a Coronado brand shoe boot size 39. Another bag would contain a stocking in which a human foot is found and it was in advanced stages of decomposition. The body part of the foot is already decayed to the stage where fat is saponified, that is the phenomenon that occurs one to two months after death, and this is obviously what caused the smell of decomposition that they have all felt. The foot itself is still covered with skin, but much of the nails have fallen off. As they have this evidence now, on June the 22nd, just before the second rope bridge, a short jeans, that was Chris's, and a piece of dark cloth were found. And then, at another location, a piece of pelvic bone. At that time, a member of the Dutch police, Wim Perlot, was also in Panama, and he agreed to work together with the Panamanian police to interrogate all of the witnesses again under oath before the discovery of the backpack. At the request of the Dutch Forensic Institute, NFI, they're going to give the backpack with part of its contents to Wim Perlot for analysis in the Netherlands. Due to the weather conditions becoming harsh after June the 22nd, after these bones were found, the searches would stop and they would only be resumed by the end of July. But something that I find interesting and is mentioned in the book, it is that the, with the information of the bones, so as soon as they found the pelvic bone, as soon as they found the foot and then the shoe, Betsaida said that they could immediately rule out that the two young women were held at some location against their will, or that they were working in a brothel, which, like, Okay. And from what I read, if you remember, the foot will be Lisan's and the pelvic bone would be Chris's. So, by the finding of the pelvic bone, they kind of knew that Chris wasn't alive yet. But there was still hope for Lisan, because even though, yes, the foot has been found inside of a shoe, if there was any foul play, she technically could still be alive. So what I see from this statement, and really that is blatantly obvious throughout her whole commentary in the book, it is that they immediately discarded any options of foul play and immediately started looking at what options of a possible accident, the girls getting lost, would explain where they found the bones, where they found the rucksacks, the data on all of the phones, and also the conditions of the bodies, like what would explain it the best which just tells you how early in this investigation they immediately started being biased. Let's call it for what it is and having tunnel vision. 
On Friday, the 18th of July, a remembrance service was held in Amersfoort for both Chris and Lizanne, and both families would join the service. A couple of days after this, on the 24th of July, both of the families gave a press release announcing that they feel that they need to go their own ways and handle the ongoing search regarding the disappearance of their daughters in their own way. Chris's parents will return two days after that, on the 26th, back to Panama to start searching on their own. On the 30th of July, the searches have resumed and some more bones have been found by locals who were helping with the search and by the tour guide F. In August, further searches will resume and other elements of the girls' bodies will be found. On August the 1st, the searches started again and the Kramers family chose a Panamanian lawyer, Enrique Arrocha, to present the power of attorney. On the 2nd of August, further bones will be found, and 13 days after this finding, one of the bones will be Chris's rib, and the other two will belong to an indigenous person and to some animals. Kramer's family, having a Panamanian lawyer, now returned to the Netherlands, and this lawyer, Enrique Arrocha, on the 13th of August filed a complaint against the prosecution service in Panama in name of the Kramer's family. They accused Betsaida and the prosecution service of mishandling the case and performing a weak investigation. He would say in this complaint that the tests that were performed by the Institute of Legal Medicine and Forensic Sciences in Panama was done to the skeletal remains of the second finding and it was negative, meaning that false evidence was possibly being created and planted. He said they are planting bones and evidence, something that is a crime and that worries us. But then on the 16th of August, they finally had the information from the Forensic Sciences Institute that the bones found indeed contained DNA material from Chris, so that it was her rib bone. One of her ribs was found. And as we know, this, together with her pelvic bone, will be the only two elements of Chris's Kramers' skeleton that will be found. Two days after that, on the 18th of August, Enrique Arrocha, the lawyer, will say that there were findings of the Dutch NFI Forensic Institute that haven't been passed to the Panamanian authorities. It turned out that the NFI report was waiting on the Dutch general prosecutor's desk. This lawyer will walk this route himself on the 28th of August, and he will say that he is about 85% sure that Chris and Lizanne didn't lose track and didn't get lost on this trail. Only the day later, on the 29th, further bones will be found. Two bones from a lower leg, a small bone, and a piece of skin. They will be found by Louis A, and the conditions were bad in Alto Romero at the time, so the helicopters couldn't fly in to take those bones away, meaning that these remains will end up being brought over by foot along the Panama Trail to Boquete. On the 1st of September, according to Chris's family, that NFI report was sitting in the Dutch embassy in Panama for 10 days by that point. On 4th of September, the Froon family will finally have some answers because the two large left leg bones were found to be belonging to Lisan. So by this point, they had to presume that both girls have died. On the 18th of September, the autopsy will be performed on the bones that were found on the 29th of August. And they are going to find out that Lisanne's bones were actually tibia and femur like bones. The tibia, the shin bone, showed some signs of periostitis, meaning exertions, but on neither of the bones they could find any fractures or laceration wounds. Then, on the 19th of September, that autopsy report is presented. And Betsaida is by this point convinced that the girls died eight days after they went missing. She suspects the swollen river to be the culprit by this point and says that thinking that the girls were murdered would be an irresponsible theory. One sentence in the autopsy report, though, states that it's important to indicate that north and west isn't marked on the map 
where they found the bones. So the precise location of the bone remains is unknown, making it impossible to locate them on the geographic map, making it then impossible to know if they were really found upstream or downstream, which is going to confuse so many people online, and which should have been done properly, but because most of these bones and remains were found by locals, or guides, not the people working for the police, for Sinaproc, for Sena Front, they never were processed correctly. This is something we're gonna touch upon a tiny bit later, because we are soon coming towards the end of this timeline. As a response of one of the main journalists who was writing for the Panamanian La Estrella, Adelita Coriat, and who was writing heavily against PT and against the prosecution service, what PT Betsaida, is going to do if they find out that the bodies of the girls were on the farm of a local. If there was foul play involved, Betsaida responded, we are going to kill them. But the criminologists of the public ministry of the Institute of Legal Medicine and Forensic Sciences do not give me grounds to think that this is a homicide. On the 24th of September, the bone elements of Lisan Froon are flown to her parents in the Netherlands on her birthday. A lot of people will criticize this decision because the further investigation on the bones is needed, further bone findings are needed to even start to establish the time of death, the day of death, any further data that is necessary to actually deduce whether or not this was an accident or foul play, then when you compare it to the data that was on the phones and the cameras. This is going to be further supported by the actual autopsy reports on Chris's bones. We know that only a pelvic bone and a rib bone have been found for Chris, and there will be signs of bleaching, especially on the pelvic bone, something that we are going to analyze a bit more further down the line in this and the next video. But it led people to believe that, again, something like foul play shouldn't have been discarded, because immediately as these autopsy reports were published, they attributed this to the sun, to the sunshine, in direct contact with the bones, which is how bleaching would have happened. But the criminologist, especially the one that was prevalent in this case, called Octavio Calderon, refutes any of these statements, saying that there was no scientific basis for the claim that the two women got lost and then were swept away by the river. Because of all of these claims, because everybody was breathing behind her neck and people were suing her left, right and center, the job was passed from Betsaida Pitti to her direct boss, Ada Belfon. According to Betsaida, though, at this point, and this will never be, like, fully clarified, but the book leads you to believe that Lisan's family does believe in the accident theory, in the fact that they might have slipped and fell, and you can't really blame them because there were more bones found on Lisan. There was no bleaching on Lisan's bones. You can see how it would be easier for them to believe in something like this, that is, if the information in the book is correct. Betsaida, though, words this in this way, speaking about Lisan's family, saying that they seem to understand that their daughter made a wrong decision on that first day of April 2014. On the other hand, if the language school had simply made sure that the volunteer work would have continued, the women would not have gone into the mountains without a guide to begin with. Which sure, but also just assume some responsibility and don't put the blame on everybody else. Now, we are already in October, so we kind of know that there's not much happening on the search front anymore, that the investigations and the searches are really subsiding, and that it kind of seems from the limited amount of events that happen in this timeline from this point on, that they had the tunnel vision, that they always thought that this was an accident, that the girls might have gotten lost and then fell off a bridge, off a cliff, something that we are gonna conclude on later, and that they were just going to fight for it. Nothing much will be done to change their mind, they say. Chris's parents, though, were not giving up. They had only two bones of their daughter 
really weird data if you think about Chris's iPhone activity as well. The fact that somebody was trying to break into it but didn't know a pin or didn't even try the pin doesn't indicate to them that that was Chris. Then that night picture of Chris's hair. Like, you can really see that they still needed more answers. So they made other late-night TV show appearances in the Netherlands on the RTL late night on the 1st of October 2014. And here they revealed that there was DNA of an unknown person found on the backpack of Chris's and Lisanne's. At this point, they did not believe that their daughter and her friend Lisanne got lost in the jungle of Panama. According to them, two forms from the Panamanian authorities state that Chris and Lisanne were kidnapped. This was followed on the 16th of October by a lawsuit that was against the Panamanian public prosecutor on behalf of the Kramer's family, and they were suing them in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for negligent handling on Chris's case. Now, if somebody knows what happened with this, let me know. Because on Scarlett's blog, the only thing that I could find is that in order for this to go this far, the Kramer's family would need to prove with documentation that the Panamanian state was negligent with guaranteeing the two tourists fundamental rights to live. So I'm not sure how would that be proven. If somebody has any information on this, let me know in the comments. I'll pin that, make one big pin comment with that. Then, by the end of October and beginning of November, the bones from Lisan would be buried in a private ceremony, and Chris's parents would request for the bones and the possessions of Chris's to be transferred to the Dutch embassy in Panama. On December the 3rd, the last search round in Panama was announced, and this was the very last attempt to find more remains and hopefully close the investigations. The Dutch Rescue Dog Foundation would fly over again, and the Dutch pathologist, Frank Wandergut, would also travel to Boquete. This operation, according to all accounts, including Betsaida's, was rough, and due to the weather conditions and the risk of flash floods, the search teams never made it to the river. So, on the 18th of January, it was finally stopped. Betsaida got a knee ankle injury during this operation, and she was no longer a prosecutor and was finally taken off the case. This is how the last search went, according to Betsaida and the records from the book. Because she was held personally responsible for the dog handlers, she went to Alto Romero on January the 13th with a large team of people, including her legal secretary officials from the Institute of Legal Medicine, a forensic anthropologist, biologist, cartographer, people from Senafron, the National Police and Civil Defense, a paramedic and six volunteers. I'm gonna shorten a bunch of the stuff that she says because she goes on and on. It took them four hours to walk two miles across wet, cold meadows and through wooded areas with dense vegetation. They passed seven rivers. After an hour's walk, she sank into mud up to her thighs, injuring her right ankle and right knee in the process. Despite the pain, she walked for another three hours that day. It took them until 5 p.m. that afternoon to arrive to the Marcucci Finca. The volunteers and everybody else present apart from her would go through the Serpent Trail again to see if they can find any other body parts, but she couldn't because she was injured. And only two days later, the weather improved enough for the helicopters to land to Alto Romero to pick them up. She had to have a surgery as a result of this trip, and that's why another officer was put on the case. Until a month after the surgery, she was unable to work. After her rehab, she went to the human resources to report back. And although she had been with the district attorney's office for 22 years and was injured while performing her duty, she was told she would be given another position at one-third of her rate of her usual salary. Basically, she's getting demoted. She never felt so helpless. When the Dutch ambassador said goodbye, she attended the reception, nevertheless. 
For her son, she continued to work for the public prosecutor's office. Because her knee kept hurting, she asked for time off so that she could be examined. And when the reason for her request was doubted, she resigned. Even now, seven years later, she's still walking with a slight limp. She makes my skin crawl. Allegedly, okay? I don't want people to sue me in this video, so this is my opinion. Okay? This is my opinion. Let me know if you want to stop this video and put in the comments what you're thinking about this woman. She wrote less than 20 pages in this book, and most of them are about her fucking limbs, dehydration, how hard it was for her to go by and, like, try to search for these girls' bodies. And I wouldn't understand it, even if it was just one of us, who is literally just following this as armchair detectives. But for a person that has been doing this, apparently, according to her, her own words, for 22 years, which would be interesting to know if somebody knows any tea on her previous career and how she conducted the investigations in the past, that would be another great comment down below. For somebody who was actually on the scene, who was talking to the parents, who knew how the rucksack was found, who knew how the body remains were found, for somebody to actually be there and to be this tone deaf, like to a certain degree, I can understand that she's trying to portray all of these conditions as the situation that the girls might have found themselves in. But girl, read the room. Read the fucking room. There is this footage, this interview that I have watched where they're interviewing the forensic pathologist and the body remains are leaving the morgue and they're leaving the morgue in baby coffins. The fact that a concept, the fact that baby coffins exist is morbid enough, is messed up enough. The fact that 21 and 22 year olds bodies are leaving a morgue in such coffins is next level. And this bitch is here like, oh my god, I have a lib. This is your job. Everybody in this investigation is acting like this mountain, this volcano, everything erected yesterday. Like, oh, this was so hard on us. Why don't you have processes in place? When we take it apart now, trust me, I don't think that there will be a soul that will be sorry for Bethsaida and her fucking limp. I get a bit pissed when I'm sick, but like... Why do you contribute on a book and then not give us any concrete details? Anything that isn't on the internet? Anything that you would be privy to as the information? Why do you contribute on a book and just speak about the conditions and about how it affected you? Like, what is the point? Like, I understand why certain details wouldn't be shared with the public. Like, certain details obviously can't leave the police records can't actually be shared with everybody and also they can only probably be shared with the family if they request them themselves but if you already share something then share it in full things like chain of custody who touched the evidence so that they can separate the offender traces from the police traces who gave it to whom and in what span of time do they even have this recorded? Because she leaves out the most important bits. She usually says, like, these people found the rucksack and then handed it over and then we picked it up from Alt Romero. Who? When? Why? Why weren't there people with gloves? People who... People among the volunteers who could process this evidence and then bring it right to the forensic services, right to the autopsy? in order for us to then have the chain of evidence, meaning where the evidence had been and what happened to it. This is why where this investigation will lead and where it will really end is just so unbelievable to so many people. Because it just seems like she doesn't know what answers people actually care about. And she doesn't know what answers people should care about because there's so many unanswered questions here. By September, the autopsies would have been completed and the conclusions would be made. And in the article for the newspapers La Estrella of September the 27th, PT reported that the prosecution had formally concluded that Chris and Lizanne died after they were swept away by the river. Not that they had fallen off one of the monkey bridges, as they immediately assumed. So the swollen river was the culprit, as she tends to say in this book. 
the case will be formally closed in March of 2015 after the joint statement of the Foon and Kramer's families. The investigation in Panama ended then and the press stopped reporting on it, apart from, like, some news bulletins with the updates and the articles in the Daily Beast. So, let me play what the Dutch investigator Frank van der Goot, that was one of the people that was working on behalf of the families, concluded, because his conclusion was that the girls might have fallen off the slope, and then the river, the swollen river, has then carried away their bodies, and that's why the bones were found where they were found. And then I will read some parts of that press release. En Lisanne verdwenen bijna een jaar geleden tijdens een wandeltocht in de jungle. Een team van specialisten met een analyse van mogelijke scenario's. Ik denk wel dat op grond van het onderzoek wat we gedaan hebben, we eigenlijk tot de conclusie zijn gekomen dat uh, een ongevalscenario het meest waarschijnlijk is. Geen verdwaling, geen misdrijf, maar een valpartij zou de twee vrouwen noodlottig zijn geworden. Paul naast het pianistapad is een steile helling. Indien men daar uitgeleid en ten val komt, dan val je 30, 40 meter onder een hoek van 60 graden omlaag. Je komt in een, in een bedding terecht, een rivierbedding. Uh, op de camera's van de meisjes zijn een serie foto's gevonden waarin delen van de bedding en delen van de omgeving te zien. The team has done a thoroughly investigation regarding the scenario involving a possible crime. The geographical conditions, social conditions and technical facts which have surfaced during the forensic investigation suggest a crime such as a robbery, sexual offense, an act of violence or a kidnapping highly unlikely. The option which remains is a fatal accident, possibly caused by an unfortunate crash. Especially the last part of descending the Pianista Trail seems to have all the geographical conditions to suggest this is in fact a possible cause. In the event of crashing down these slopes, the victim or victims will find themselves in one of the riverbeds, which river ultimately leads to the Culebra River. Circumstances down the riverbeds are similar to those found in the pictures retrieved from the digital camera. A fatal crash is also a conclusion which can be supported by the results of the investigations of discovered remains. The team of rescue dogs, assisted by the Panamanian authorities, have tried to reach the area where remains have been found in the past. Forensic specialists conclude Chris and Lisan have most likely suffered a fatal accident where they have possibly crashed down a slope or which it was impossible to climb back up again without proper equipment. Crashing down a slope in this area would have easily covered the difference in height, up to about 30 to 40 meters, which increases the chances of severe injuries. Aside from that, the riverbed is surrounded by waterfalls and steep cliffs of several meters in height. This location has now been pointed out by different people, including specialists, independently from each other and acting without any self-interest. We have recently received confirmation by the Dutch Forensic Institute that the remains found in Panama are indeed remains belonging to Chris. We are now able to start arranging a funeral. As a family, we are very relieved that finally, after all this time, we have found a plausible explanation regarding all the questions we had surrounding the passing of our beloved daughter Chris. We hereby want to give a huge thank you to all the people involved in getting answers for Chris and getting the truth to what happened to Chris and Lisanne since their mysterious disappearance on April the 1st of last year. If we were to summarize why this investigation was botched from the get-go in a couple of main points, the points would be mostly surrounding the custody chain and then the chain of evidence. So, the evidence collection procedures were shite, to begin with, there was no custody chain. The information that is including the place of the finding, the exact location, picking of the remains, the packing and the transfer from the scene. And according to Octavio Calderon, the criminologist on the case, he believes that Betsaida should have been disqualified from being involved in the case just solely on the basis of the custody chain and how it was conducted. As we know, she was disqualified. She was demoted, she received a pay cut, and she was replaced by her immediate boss, Anna Belfon. But that was done in January of 2015, and the investigation concluded in March. 
other holes in this investigation were that the locals were usually the ones looking for the remains, disrupting the sites, putting their DNA all over the rucksack, all over the evidence that then had to be eliminated, the NFI DNA, like everybody's DNA had to be eliminated. It's like this whole investigation was conducted backwards instead of just the normal way. Very limited information was made available to the public, sparking all of the theories. And the two bits that we are about to discuss is that many pieces of evidence were never followed up on, such as fingerprints. And the case was closed before all of the questions would get any sort of legitimate answers. So let us tear some of these bits apart. Some will fit here better in the flow of the story, and some of them I'm going to mention in the part on theories. Let's see what discrepancies scream at people the most. And let's start off with the backpack. The backpack, as we know, was found on June the 11th, 2014, by the Culebra River in the district of Ayarisco, which is the community of Alto Romero, which is roughly 10 to 15 kilometers north of the Mirador. It was found by a woman named Irma, who was named Jane Doe at the time to protect her identity. She went to the river in order to take a bath, and as we know from the book, this was apparently two hours from Alto Romero, from her house, so she wouldn't go there often. She hadn't been there in a while, and that is why nobody found the backpack until then. While she was having a bath, she noticed the backpack within some driftwood at the shore of the river, near huge boulders, so she decides to investigate it, she opens it, discovers the cell phones, the camera, and other items. In the interviews later, she would say that she called her husband and then she would bring the rucksack home, but they would say that the husband called the local cattle rancher that would later be identified as the guide, Feliciano, and they would tell him what they found. He would be the one to call the police for them and handed the bag to the police the day later. This isn't made super clear. Like, did Feliciano come to them? on that day. Was he the one handing the backpack? Did he open it? The f a lot of things that would make a huge difference here. Did Irma and Luis open it, go through it, take certain things out? The exact location, like, this is 2014, why is nobody using phones which they have on them? Why is nobody snapping pictures? We have from the book the location, but it is kind of rough, you know, like, there's no pointer as to exactly where it was found, in terms of, like, you know, where between the rock and the tree. Upstream, downstream. Where is it? It makes a huge difference. It's just, like, it's kind of here, and the picture can be a freaking postcard, for all we know. There would be a picture of the backpack that would be taken in Alto Romero, probably by one of them, again, if they kept the chain of custody, we would know by whom, but we don't. But all of the items look dry in that picture, everything looks dry and clean, but we know from the police files that there was actually some dirt in the bag, as was some yellowish-brown clay at the ends of the straps, and also some plant fragments and loose sand inside of the bag, so why does it look so clean in those pictures? Another thing that people online cannot seem to agree on is the elevation. Is Was this backpack found upstream or downstream? Which would make a huge difference because the only logical thing that would explain the accident and the backpack just not being planted there would be if it was going downstream, following the river and then just being stranded in between the rock and the tree. That would later be debated because by that point, if it was actually going through the river, everything inside of that backpack should be destroyed, completely corroded, etc. But that wasn't the case because we have the data. According to Scarlett's blog called Case, Lisanne's partial remains were found scattered and in the vicinity of those of her best friend, both upstream and downstream from Alto Romero, and the backpack was also found upstream from the Mirador. 
But then when I looked at the imperfect plan at Chris's blog, he gives us the elevations. So Alto Romero, according to him, is at 800 meters. Google tells me around 1,000, 1,100 meters. So I don't know if, again, there are different elevations to this place. And the girls went missing between 1,800 to 1,300 meters in elevation. So the remains were definitely found downstream. I think that myth has been rebuffed. And from what I see in elevation, so was the backpack. It was found at a lower location than El Mirador, than like the Continental Divide, because we know that they have already went, supposedly, beyond El Mirador and have started moving downwards just in the opposite direction. So you can see how people believe that this investigation should still be open because even the basic things have not been answered. What also hasn't been answered is this backpack was with Irma and Luis for about 48 hours. They could have dried it, they could have done anything to it, Feliciano could, was he there, where was he, do we have the accounts for him during those days. According to Scarlett's blog and Juan, who is Google Drive I shared in the past video because he has like a full-on timeline of the pictures and he is the one that believes that the pictures are photoshopped, the rucksack was actually left hanging on a nail in the wall of the house of the people in Alto Romero before the police came and picked it up. Remember that, again, we don't know if this is legitimate information, is it in police files, because of how I'm going to describe the backpack was found a bit later. But now, Lost in the Wild documentary was published, it is one of the more recent publications, except from the book. It came out in 2019. And it is done by this woman, Kinga Phillips, and her producer, possibly partner. I didn't really look into them. I did check the documentary out, and I will be including some parts of it throughout the video, if not copyrighted. But the part that I want to play for you is when the two of them interviewed Irma and Luis. So the couple that found the backpack. Well, Irma found it, and then she called her husband. Because during this interview, they give a completely different account of events as to where the backpack was found. They say that they found the rucksack at the Boquete side of the Continental Divide, which would mean that the girls would have reached El Mirador and then would have turned back, and that they would have never even made it to the Serpent Trail. And when, when I approached the edge of the river, I saw uh, what looked like a backpack, you know, from the distance and, and, and trapped between the rocks on the edge of the river. What happened when you turned the backpack into the authorities? When he when she handed it over to him, he called a nearby cattle rancher and informed him what he had found. He called the border police. So he handed the backpack directly over to the police. O sea, tú la evidencia, la de la autoridad. Yeah, he did. So these are the photos that we have. Esas son las fotos que tenemos. Okay, so this is this is the river. Yes, he saw these. Había visto esto. Esta es la. She says that's up in Pianista. Between him on the other side. On the other side of where? Oh, the divide. He says it's on that side. It's on the on, the, on their side. He's saying that that is on the Bouquete side the of the continental divide. Paul, I just want to get this super clear. This photo is not taken on this side of the divide. The official story is that the girls hiked the Pianista Trail to the Continental Divide and then continued onto the Serpent Trail and then died at the Monkey Bridge. But Luis knows these trails better than anyone, and he says without a doubt that this photo was taken hours after the girls reached the Continental Divide and shows them hiking on the Pianista Trail back towards Bouquete. And that that means that they would have never even gone to the Serpent Trail, they reached the Continental Divide and then turned back. So how did their stuff get in the river if the girls never made it there? Now, this could be one of the two things. It could be that the memory has faded within 2014 and 2019, that between those times maybe they have forgotten where they were when the rucksack was found, 
or it can be that they knew where the rucksack was found all along, but they just were afraid to come forward to actually say to the police because they believed it was the police. They're going to actually put the records straight. They're going to record the actual location. But I don't see that this was ever reported in the police files, that anything really came out of this interview. You let me know if you know otherwise. Like, did this yield anywhere. And is this when the theories have began? Because in the last part, we are going to talk about the theories that the girls never made it to El Mirador. So, were the Photoshop theories and all of the theories supporting that, that, you know, the girls maybe started walking or that they actually entered the cab and never even went out on a hike, that all of the other witness testimonies are fake, was that started after this documentary, or was it started much, much before? There are internet sleuths that know way too much on this story, and a lot more than me, so I don't pretend that I know everything. You guys let me know in the comments. Now, let's speak about the condition of that backpack, because, again, there are holes in the story, questions that need to be answered. What a lot of people would agree in this story was that there was some damage to the backpack, but that it isn't really consistent with it having traveled through the river, having been scraped by the rocks for quite a substantial amount of time, literally between some point in April and when it was found in the beginning of June. The damage was light, and really probably not consistent with it traveling for kilometers in a wild river. According to the police files, there was some dirt in the bag. The attachment of one of the straps was partially loose. The plastic closures contained some scratches, possibly due to the abrasion. There were some textile parts on the bag that showed some discoloration in different places. There was a rectangular piece of fabric at the top right corner that was missing, and the edges of the damage are straight. So, kind of, again, thinking that maybe somebody actually cut it, rather than that this was done by the river. It was concluded that this 10 millimeters in length of tear was actually caused by a sharp edge, and that the fabric was discolored near this damage. Again, inclining that maybe some chemicals have been used here. So, theories are either the backpack ended up in the river somehow, and then it was dragged downstream and landed in between the rock and the tree where Irma would eventually find it, or that it was planted, just like the human remains. Now, the DNA that was found on the rucksack should have alleviated, should have made us abandon all of these theories, but it just sparked the further ones. Because a total of 13 DNA samples were taken on the straps, zippers, zippers, and edges of the backpack. Out of the 13 samples, DNA was only found in three of them. The first one was apparently of a female, but then the side characteristics state that at least one unknown person was also found on these partial fingerprints, and at least one of them was male. Then another sample was of a female, another one was a mixed DNA profile, but as I mentioned in part one, no DNA match for the samples could be obtained from criminal DNA databases. So, they said that it is logical to discard them as just, you know, Panamanian authorities, NFI, dealing with a rucksack. Which, like, again, do we have gloves? Can we please start using gloves? Why do you have to go backwards and then discard your own employees who have obviously damaged and contaminated this backpack now? But the most interesting out of it all was that DNA samples also showed that there was no match to DNA of either Chris or Lizanne. This, if you believe in the accident theory, means that the DNA would have been present and then, then it was washed off. And if you believe in the foul play theory, well then that would have washed off anybody's fingerprints who potentially handled the backpack before they planted it there. 
In terms of the traces inside of the bag, there were some brown leaf fragments found, some green fragments of plants, some loose sand, and yellowish-brown clay at the ends of the webbing on the outside of the backpack. Then there were other traces of like one white fragment of a seashell and translucent plastic fragments. Now, when you hear leaves, plants, soil, you would assume that like a test would be done in order to see if it matches the soil close to where it was found. That wasn't done. A couple of you pointed out towards the glasses that were found in the backpack because we see the pictures of them as they're walking up the El Pianista trail and the glasses look in pristine condition. And then in these, I will admit, pixelated pictures, of the backpack, they kind of look oxidized, rusty. I don't even know how to describe it because the pictures are so pixelated. But there were no tests done on the glasses from what I could find. When it comes to the other contents, I spoke in length about the bras and how weird that is or how it might not be weird because maybe whatever happened to the girls happened to them during the night. But then there's other things, like phones. How was data ever been able to be retrieved from the phones if the rucksack was literally found near the river? It has been in contact with water for we don't know how long. How were the phones and the camera data salvaged? Both the phones and the camera suffered water damage, camera even cracks and dents, so the bag could have bounced off some rocks, but not too many. We don't know. We don't know the answers. The Samsung phone could be accessed without any issues, and the iPhone suffered some water damage, so only the memory card could be accessed in a separate device. The camera was wet on the inside, and it wasn't functioning either as well, so they had to use the card and then made it function through them accessing it on the computer. But also, the NFI took samples of DNA, of fingerprints, from the edges of the SIM cards, the edges and buttons of the phones, and the edges of the batteries. And on those adhesive tapes that they used to collect the fingerprints, they found three of them. But they couldn't be found in the databases. According to the book, it is logical to attribute them to whoever attached the batteries and SIM cards to the phones. What do you mean it's logical? You're not a Reddit friend. You're the forensics. Why don't we have this data? What we have is that none of these fingerprints were Chris's and Lisa's. So again, yes, the water damaged the phones, damaged the camera, could have gotten rid of these fingerprints, but why don't we have further answers on whose fingerprints they are? Surely, again, if all of your employees have to be fingerprinted because everybody fucks up here in this department, you can say that you discarded them. The NFI also examined the bras, and the samples that were taken from outside of the cups and the metal fastenings were slightly rusted. The flowered bra had some fragments of plants and leaves and loose sand, and the black bra had some brown fragments of leaves, loose sand, and transparent plastic fragments that were found. So, as you can hear, some of these fragments match what was found in the backpack. There was a DNA profile that was obtained, but it turned out to be from an NFI employee. So, in total, of course, local newspapers reported that PT Leading the investigation, never further investigated any of these leads, any of these further DNA samples, and that would be the key to this investigation, finding out who do these DNA samples actually belong to. The media would report that there would be as many as 34 different fingerprints that were found, 13 on the backpack, 12 on the phones and the camera, and 6 on the bra. But a lot of them would not be suitable for identification, and the ones they would, would be from the employees that were processing those belongings. When it comes to the rucksack, based off how it was found, based off the data that was collected from the phones and the camera, the forensic examination of it would conclude that there was no indication of a crime. 
But other things beyond the DNA profiles, beyond the fingerprints that we don't have information on, was that there was a plastic bottle missing. If you remember the pictures of Chris and Lisanne posing before the Continental Divide, before the Serpent Trail, Chris is holding two pictures. The one where they thought that there was a dog, that there was blue in it. Some people do say that there is some sunscreen missing. The tests haven't been performed on the glasses. And also, there was one water bottle found. So, even if they disposed the other one, even if the two of them just decided to throw it, which, why would you if the two of you are both surviving in the wilderness? If the two of you have a plan, why are you sharing a single water bottle? But the second water bottle was found and there was some water inside of it. And that water was never tested. This would have been another crucial piece of evidence, just like the soil, because you could get something, something scientific out of it. It could determine if it was tap water, if they were held somewhere, or if it was shop water, if they bought the bottles from the shop, if it was water from Miriam's house, or was it the river water, which would match the accident getting lost theory. In order to reach the conclusion that the girls did meet some sort of fatal accident, the prosecution office will also need the autopsies and the analysis of the bones. So, let's speak about how they were found. On August the 2nd, 2014, the residents of Alto Romero found two bones. This would be a pelvic bone and a rib. As we see from Chris's blog, some of the remains would be found at around 800 meters, so, again, downstream, according to him, jean shorts that belong to Chris would be found at around 800 meters as well, and then last remains would be found at the elevation of 400 meters. But, yet again, because they learned nothing from how they processed the backpack, it's important to indicate that the north and the west were not marked, so the precise location of the bone remains is unknown, making it impossible to locate it on a map. We can only know the rough area that you can see on this map, and the one that I have posted in part one, but as Scarlett's blog states, the bone remnants were found several walking hours away, again, further up north, so north of the Continental Divide. Lisanne's partial remains were found scattered and in the vicinity of those of her best friend, both upstream and downstream from Alto Romero, and the backpack was found apparently upstream from the Mirador. When speaking about the investigation, we mentioned how Betsaida said that they were found, that the bones would be found in the water, so that one person discovered a foot, and then the other one discovered the rib bone that belonged to Chris, so Lisanne's foot, and then, like, on the opposite side of the river, inside of the water, the rib was discovered. That will be taken apart, and also debated on the internet a lot, because according to Octavio Calderon, the criminologist, two bones from different parts of the body, from two different people, never end up together on a sandbar. This shows that somebody placed them there. There's no other reason for the bones to be found that way. But the bones, if we are to believe the book, if we are to believe the searchers and the searchers who have found them, haven't been found like on top of one another. They have been found meters apart. What is suspicious to me is both things. One, that bones don't float, something that we're gonna speak in the theories part, and the second one is how was the foot found on the ground, like on the soil part of the area? Why wasn't the foot found in the water as decomposed as the other remains? So, let's speak about how the foot was found. According to Scarlett's blog, it was found protected by its boot. The laces were still laced tightly, and there was also a sock inside of it, containing the foot, which still had some skin and tissue on it. The guide F found the brown shoe with a foot behind and almost under a tree, near to Alto Romero and away from the river. Forensics would later show that there is a breaking line on the bone of the foot, and it was surprisingly clean, and there was no blood found on it. But what also wasn't found were any signs of cutting, of hacking, gunshots, teeth, claw markings, 
So, so to discarding both the possibility that they were attacked by animals and by humans, by weapons. Lisan's food, and I mean in general how bones were found and which bones rather weren't found, was also why they could never determine the cause of death. Because there was no evidence for bone trauma, with the coroner's remark that the most important bones, like the skull, the thorax bones, and the pelvic girdle, were not found, and that those would possibly establish the cause of death of the victims. According to the Scarlet's blog, at least 33 scattered bones were discovered along the same riverbank. Most of those were from Lisan's foot. Now, the shoe with the foot inside of it was found upstream. The other bones were found scattered around, sometimes kilometers apart from one another, but all of them following the course of the river. But because of how this investigation was run, some would never have the exact location. We would never know where exactly they would be found by the volunteers. According to the autopsies, bleaching was only detected on Chris's bones, so mostly on the pelvic bone, but from this blog, I have not seen that they have ever done a fluid detection analysis to discard the possibility that they were bleached by the chemicals. Also, what I've seen Scarlett mention is that there were no DNA tests that were run to the shoe, that we just assumed that it was Lisan's because it was a wild beast brand, which could only be a Dutch brand, which... Which, how do you discard it like this? And also then they found a blue boot, which they presumed belonged to Chris. Why not do DNA tests? The boot was still found on the ground. It should have some sort of DNA that belonged to Chris, if it actually did. But we just don't have the answers to those questions. And something, if this isn't enraging enough, remember the backpack collection? Yeah, the fact that we don't know really where it was found, that it was in Alto Romero, that they called the guy death, that it was waiting in Alto Romero for it to be collected for about two days. Yeah. So, that fades to compare to how they collected these bones. Because, again, we don't have the chain of custody, like where exactly, why this hasn't been pinpointed, pictures taken, professionals being on the screen, but that's not really what will enrage you. Because this was so hard on Betsaida, because the bones were found in the inaccessible parts of the jungle. Each time remains were found, it took days before the specialists could be on the spot, and the Indians, the indigenous people of Alto Romero, who had found them, had by then already secured the remains and taken them all the way to Alto Romero. So, she said this was against her instructions, Betsaida's instructions were, she asked the Indians to put everything they found directly into these yellow envelopes and to mark the spots they found them in, to maintain the chain of evidence. This is obviously a necessary measure because, you know, the jungle is vast. The place is vast. So she is again adding the blame onto somebody else for, you know, taking the items home, safeguarding them, keeping them protected, not like actually marking up the areas. Which just shows you how these searches have been done. Day one, why hasn't somebody come and told these people, okay, we are looking for them alive, but there is a chance we might be looking for them dead after a certain period of time, so if you find remains, this is what you do. You mark it, you stand there, you wait for somebody, you wait for the professionals to process this evidence, you don't treat human bodies like... I don't know how else to describe it, but, like, they're garbage. Like, they're not humane. Like, they're just not human. You don't treat anybody like this. To wrap it up with the conclusions from the autopsies, Chris's bones would contain traces of phosphorus, which could be due to lime that is found on all of the farms, and also it could be due to the direct bone exposure to sunlight. Bones didn't show any marks or abrasions, which is weird both ways, if there was no weapons used, but also it was weird if they were actually decomposing and then going downstream through the river. Chris's pelvis bone was found and it was broken almost in half, and that bone was also the one that had the most bleachings on it. 
when they examined Lisan's foot, they found that there were only three bones broken, and those bones were on top of her foot. So her heel, ankle, and all of the other bones below the foot were intact and not broken. The rolled up piece of skin that was found in some of the remains was later determined to be of an animal. None of Lisan's bones also had marks or abrasions on them, not even the normal wear or tear that you would expect if they were washed down the river. And also the two leg bones that they found showed she had suffered periostitis, especially the shin bone. I'm actually not sure about the thigh one. Which means that it looked like she had lived longer because of the stage of decomposition, Lisan's body remnants were found, and also that she had exerted herself, maybe by walking for a longer period of time than Chris. The gaps we have in this story was why today, in 2021, seven years after, more remains haven't been found. Why there weren't more searches conducted, or not even that, why they didn't surface. Especially skulls. Especially their skulls, because in both girls' cases, their skulls were never found. The night pictures don't show direct body of water, so we can't really make the conclusions of where they were seen, but they show a bunch of soil, which again, if you were to compare, if they were soil specialists put on this case, or just with bare due diligence was done, maybe something would have come out of that. The state of Lisan's foot is the one that lives in my head rent-free, like how was it severed? Why was that never explained? How did it look like a clean cut, but it didn't look like sharp objects were involved in order to cut it? Were her pants ever found? I don't see this anywhere, and nobody, everybody seems to forget that only Chrissy's shorts were found, and nobody in mind really thinks about, like, Lisan was wearing clothes as well. Were there tops ever found? Like, why are we not focusing on certain things at all? On how bones were found, but Saida's conclusions were, why are they going to plant it there, with so much land available? Let's suppose they were killed, why are you going to place the backpack here? For what? I would tell you that I found the evidence, but I cannot say that it was planted. We did not find the rest of the skeleton. If a person planted the bones there, with what intention did they do it? However, you can also see that because of the lack of answers, we might be led to believe that they were indeed planted, because it did the trick if they did plant the bones. The trick being that the searches have stopped. They were limited at first, and then they completely stopped. The investigation was summarized quite quickly after the last bones and the autopsies were performed, and that is exactly what somebody planting the bones would have wanted for the searches to stop, for the families to believe that their girls are dead. And also possibly for the certain names that we have been repeating throughout this story to then cash out on that reward, because they were searching harder than everybody else, and they found most of the remains. So let us speak about some of those people, and let's speak about the suspects. Just a disclaimer, and I would like you guys in the comments to also be kind of careful. None of these people have ever been prosecuted for the crimes. As I said, I don't even... I wouldn't even call them suspects myself. I'd say maybe people of interest at best, at most. So, a lot of blog posts, literally almost everything that I have seen, refers to Feliciano Gonzalez, the man we are going to speak about first, as Guide F. So from now on, I'm gonna do the same, because it kind of makes me believe that maybe they're doing that, so they're not liable, so nobody sues their ass. And everything we are gonna hear from now on is actually speculation. If anybody has an actual police file, if anybody has any record that any of these people have been looked into, arrested, have previous police records, let me know. But everything that I have seen here, really, when it comes to the suspects, is hearsay. And that can be watched in investigations, because why don't we have data on who was actually interrogated? How were they cleared? Do they have their alibis? Again, it could be just a couple of sentences, with the keywords in order to alleviate the public. 
but we don't have that. So just wanted to cover my ass and to say that everything that I'm saying from this point on is hearsay, is people's theories on the internet or my own opinion, okay? Innocent until proven guilty. You might be frustrated about it, but it is what it is by now. Certain arguments that could work against Guide F was that he knows this area better than anybody else. This is something we spoke about in the first part of this series. He might know shortcuts, might know routes that nobody else is privy to. He also owns a coffee farm and a house that overlooks the volcano and the surrounding area. At the beginning of this video, I was walking you through the tips, the raids that they have done on the fincas, on the houses. I have not seen mentioned in this book or anywhere that they have raided his own. Why is that not mentioned? You kind of have to wonder about these things. Did they raid his house? Did they find anybody? Did they ever question him on where he was on certain dates? On the first, on the days where the bodies were found? How did he find them? Did they question, you know, people that were searching with him? Did they ever check for foul play? Like, for any possible weapons that he might have used? And something that I'd personally like to know, and I know plenty of you would, is did they ever question Eileen? Was he ever left in Miriam's house by himself, in the room of the girls, to plant the evidence that would indicate that he had met them, agreed upon this tour with them, or was that ever explained in any way? Why would that tourist business card, whatever you want to call it, why was that ever found in the girls' room? He, in many people's books, is extremely suspicious because from the videos that, you know, I'm playing during this part, the next part, he is everywhere. He has planted himself in the searches for the girls. He is the person that we have seen has found a, quite a few of the girls' remains, just happens to smell them, to come upon them. He was also present during the multiple searches with the parents as well him and Plinio Montenegro as well. Usually you would have perpetrators of the crimes involve themselves in the searches, in the investigation to a certain point in order to get that control, in order to know what the others know. It could be as innocent as him being the guide who knows all the rules. Like, of course, he's not gonna say no to the family being like, yeah, let's retrace the same route, but it could be something a lot more sinister than that. This next part is to give you some insight of the guide F of his lifestyle, and it is from Scarlett's blog. Somebody wrote to her, this French girl who was staying on his farm. So, in his house, she was staying during this period of time, and she kind of gives us the dynamics of the household. Again, hearsay. Just bear that in mind. These are not, like, actual facts. This person described that this was a coffee plantation, that it's kind of hard to get to it over the winding roads, and that he inherited this place from his own father. He apparently said that he owns even more terrain with coffee plants. She described that the guy Def at the time was married to a woman named Angelica, and that he had three adopted children, two girls and a boy. According to her, he had multiple brothers and sisters, and both of his parents are still alive. Guide F has multiple houses in the region and isn't always at the one that he shares with his wife and her kids. As she was staying with them, she familiarized herself with the stepchildren. Especially, there was an incident with a stepson, Henry, that a bunch of people on Reddit believe was also involved in this crime saying that he was raging at a neighbor about something that happened with a dog. Apparently, they have multiple pets, like some cats and a dog as well. Henry was really fired up by the rage and even picked up a long, sharp machete from the house to make death threats at the neighbor. And this woman felt very much afraid to keep staying there. Guy Def, according to her, seemed annoyed by his son's behavior, didn't know what to do in order to calm him down, and she found this to be a super bizarre, unhealthy atmosphere, where there might be some family secrets, that not everything is out on the surface. 
Some of you in the comments have mentioned that Guide F also has his own machete, or this might be the machete, to which I immediately command F a couple of blogs and the book, because in my head it would be logical to have it in the areas where he is a guide, and the book does mention that this is how these guides go through the brush, you know, try to go through these different paths, but also if anybody ever looked at this as if a foul play might have happened, the machete would have been possibly a logical weapon. According to this French woman, Feliciano also keeps a form of a diary. He has a pink notebook and this is where he writes all of the details of the tourists. This, as you might have heard if you have listened to hours of me talking, is never mentioned in any of the police records. They ever examine it, does he have the record of what happened during any of the dates, like March 31st, between March 31st and April the 1st, and beyond during the investigations and the searches for Chris and his son. Something that I've seen repeated, and that this French woman does state as well, is that Feliciano doesn't necessarily like to host or guide male tourists, that he gives a creepy vibe to everybody, and in a lot of the pictures, in like hot springs and just even on the trails, you do see him tending to pose next to women. She described him as somebody who is short, about 165, but is slim and strong, and she has seen him carry heavy bags of coffee and beans and fruits, and he seems to be a real force of nature, capable of walking very fast and for long times through the mountains without getting tired. In terms of the creep aspect, the book does say that they have approached a number of women that have apparently reported at some points his misconduct against them, but they wanted nothing to do with the elaboration of the allegations, and the police was not aware of any charges against him. According to the prosecution, Feliciano did make several statements, including one under oath to the police, in which he was fairly consistent. Here and there he gets mistaken about the date, but his testimonies fit the timeline. The main reason, in my opinion, why Feliciano does seem creepy, suspicious to people is A, because he inserted himself in so many searches, and B, because of that card, of that post that was left on the bed of Chris and Lee's son, indicating that they have definitely met him, maybe spoken to him, knew of him. But there are multiple conflicting accounts of events on whether the girls ever met him personally. About the 1st of April, Guy Def would say himself in an interview that he saw the two girls lounging in a hammock at the school shortly before they disappeared. And we know from the data that they did go to school that day. But then, further down the line, he would say things like, I still have contact with the girl's parents, and I don't want to make them sad. I only wanted to help. I have never seen the girls. In a further account that he told to the journalist Crit that wrote the article for the Daily Beast, I met the Hollandesas in town, but never saw them after that. So which one is it? Why do we have that information confirmed by the book or anybody else? Any official documents, I mean. Because I put here two things. Like, if he hadn't met them, and then we are saying there was a red truck, that he had approached them on the pathway beyond the stream, beyond the caldera, well, would they have entered his vehicle? Would they have trusted him enough to enter the vehicle and then you know, go down the road, down El Pianista Trail, and then somebody would overpower them, they would get kidnapped, he would drive them off the beaten path. And if he hadn't met them, who told him about the tour booking on the second? Because Eileen, according to multiple sources, later denied that she ever did. This is confirmed by the book as well, saying that Eileen was very adamant about the fact that she never told anyone that Chris and Lee's son were going to walk the Pianista Trail either. So he wasn't supposed to know 
that they were to go to the Pianista Trail. And here is something again where the school records that apparently the police has on file would have clarified that. Would he have logged on? Would he be able to see their search history? Would he have known that the girls ever planned that if nobody told him that? If we are suspecting him that he was on the 1st of April on El Pianista Trail, I don't know, in a red truck, kidnapping these girls. According to the book, there was only one paragraph literally stating this, but you make out of it as you wish. There was a police file where Ingrid Lomers, the owner of that school, after she was informed of the disappearance, contacted Guide F to tell him that Chris and Lisanne had talked about the Piedista Trail. She heard it from Marjoline, who was, well, arranging the whole nursery jobs unsuccessfully. But during Guide F's first statement to the police on April the 4th, he doesn't mention this phone call. And in the second conversation with the police on April the 7th, it also doesn't come up. But he does tell Sinaproc about it, because it's evidenced by the fact that this is where they would go to search, to the Pianista Trail. So, when did he tell Sinaproc about it? Like, was he intentionally prolonging them from searching that area. Why don't we have that on the record? Why would you have this paragraph and not clarify that? What we don't have and why everything is just hearsay and speculations on Feliciano, there are no receipts of any bookings for the tour, nothing that they would have paid to somebody for that coffee tour on the 2nd, no mentions of Eileen in their diaries, and Eileen was apparently the one booking it. But then we have Feliciano's tour booking information, his own business card in the girl's bedroom. Something that I wanted to mention and also play this one interview, you could say, with Feliciano, is that he does say the right things during the interviews. I mean, he'd be very suspicious if he wasn't the person to actually take Kramer's parents onto the trails. Like, if he wasn't the one searching for the girls, it would be suspicious because he's one of the best guides, or whatever you want to call it. He's the one that knows all the routes. So you can see how it would be extremely fucking weird if he also wasn't doing this, including the comments that he makes. He does say in multiple interviews that I found on Scarlett's channel that when Chris's parents weren't there, that when, you know, Olandessa's parents would fly and go back to the Netherlands and leave Arocha to deal with their business there, well, then nothing would be done. The helicopter suddenly wouldn't be flying over, and it would only be these guides and the volunteers searching for the women. And he also himself states that there is no way that people would stray away from the trail, that they are all marked, and that the only risk is that people forget about time and might continue down the path. The first one who was looking is Feliciano, an experienced guide who knows the wandle paths in the street very well. I was the person who, for an event that we had planned to do the day of the Miracle, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I went to look no las encontré y ya al darnos cuenta que no habían dormido en su, en su casa donde habitualmente estaban con la familia, este, al día siguiente ya cuando se cumplían las horas que estipula la ley para poner denuncia fuimos... Policía y redingswerkers hebben de afgelopen week naast het pianistapad nog talloze andere wandelpaden afgezocht, zonder resultaat. Vanaf het begin houdt de politie rekening met andere scenario's. Volgens Gids Feliciano is het onwaarschijnlijk dat de Nederlandse vrouwen zijn verdwaald no, no le veo posibilidad de que la gente se salga del sendero afuera en el bosque, más bien eh, la gente tiene que continuar caminando dentro del sendero. Este, lo que pudiera ser posibilidades para la gente como riesgo es que la gente no tome en cuenta la hora de regresar y continúe en el sendero, sí, pero no que se extravíe de, afuera del bosque, afuera en el, del sendero. Every action that he does, you can see as something suspicious, as him inserting himself into the investigation. Most of the remains and the pants were found by the same group of local guides and also some Indians. Feliciano, Laureano, who also has a farm close to where all of these remains were found, really, 
and Angel, and also some locals from Mount Romero. So, is that because they know the area well, or is it because they planted the evidence and now they're finally thinking that it's safe for them to be found and for all of these searches to stop? The same applies to the unofficial reports, because, as I mentioned, I couldn't find the official ones of the women saying how he is creepy, how they don't feel comfortable around him. On his trip advisor, usually people point to this one one-star review of this woman saying how it creeped her out, how he was kind of touchy-feely, and that it wasn't just like in, you know, oh, he's just Latino, he's from well, Central America, South America, and this is how the culture is there, that it was kind of a lot creepier than that. But then what people don't tell you is that all of the other reviews, literally every other TripAdvisor review that you can see on Feliciano is a five-star review. Is people saying how great of a guide he is, how they had a great time. And some of them are as recent as a few months ago. There's a few of them from 2021. So we know that he is still not in police custody, probably not treated as a suspect or anything like that, that he's still in the same place doing these guides. Something that I put down that I'd like you to think in the back of your head as we kind of discuss people here and as we move on to theories is who do you see as a profile of a perpetrator here? Like, is it somebody with a police record? Is it somebody who would do it again and would probably get caught, probably wouldn't be dormant for past six, seven years? Or is it a person who just took their opportunity, gained something out of it, and now they are satisfied? They haven't been caught and they don't have any other reason to commit any further crimes. Moving on to Plinio Montenegro, who is also another guide who was named often as a suspect, and he is also one of the people that joined Kramer's family, inserted himself into the investigation, and was one of the main searchers in that area. Just like with what I stated with Feliciano, everything is a speculation, and as I started there, here on Plinio, I really couldn't find much information. Some of you in the comments are literally like, I know that Guide F and Guide Plinio are responsible for this, and it's organ trafficking, I can prove it, and then you don't really give me any backup to that, so if you can prove it, prove it. Give me the links, give me the details, tell me how you can prove it. Because I found very limited information on Plinio in particular. The same way I started off with Feliciano, the most incriminating evidence in Plinio's case is a that he also inserts himself into the investigation, into the searches for the girls, and b the thumbs up pictures. The idea here is that the girls have never, in any of the pictures in Bocas del Toro and Boquete up until this point, when they reached the Mirador, have taken the thumbs up pictures. And it is weird, I'm gonna say it is weird, but again, is it proof towards anything? Is it factual? I don't think so. So, people are saying, like, it is a definite proof that somebody was with them then and there, because they have never posed like this, and somebody was probably, you know, giving them the signature pose that Plinio does in his pictures, and that is why, how that theory connects. Another thing is, in part one, I mentioned that Plinio was the one who was driving the bus from Bocas to Boquete, but then the book states that later it was demonstrated that this is false, and it was somebody called Cesar, so that the girls might not have even met Plinio at all. Again, thinking about the theory that they were lured because they knew somebody and then maybe they jumped onto a red truck, or maybe somebody first lured them and then multiple people overpower them. In terms of his whereabouts, we know that on April the 1st, Plinio was actually passing the two women, according to him, around 12 p.m. He said he was on the trail around noon, that the women said good morning to him in the European accent, and that they looked like Chris and Lisanne, but he can't be sure, because he's one of the many people that would later say, like, all of the Europeans look alike to them. 
Plinio is still active on social media. He has quite an active Instagram page from which I can see he still lives in the area and has posted about three days ago. His photography isn't really shabby, if we are honest, but just again saying, probably not treated as a suspect, even if you believe that there is evidence that he should be treated as one. And in order to discard these two, I'd like to know the answers to questions like, were their alibis checked on all of the crucial dates? Were they accounted for? Were their farms, houses checked? Because they might or might not have ever met the girls. And were their phone records ever checked? Because if we are suspecting that this is some sort of foul play, some sort of conspiracy among these guys that have found these multiple remains, was that ever checked or looked into as a possibility. Now the rest I'm just going to summarize because the book does so as well, which kind of does make me believe that they never actually looked deeper into any of this. The cab drivers. Well, in the police reports, according to the book, they came across the statements of two cab drivers who claimed to have transported Chris and Lisan. One would be Leonardo Mastino and the other one would be Umberto G. Leonardo is another person that I'm going to try to look into for the theories part because he was also found dead and it was also suspected that he has drowned or that it was kind of like an accident and people kick off when something like this happens and they kind of kick off for a reason because during the searches for these two women a couple of people did drop dead all under suspicious circumstances. This Umberto G apparently reported to Sinaproc as a witness early on and he was also questioned. He said that the women were in the back seat and that he didn't get a good look at them. So these were the two cab drivers driving them to... what's the name? Nimbus? <laughs> Nimbus? No, my, it's not Harry Potter world. Nelvis, I think, the first restaurant, the breakfast one, and then the second one was towards Il Pianista. And apparently they were also discarded because of the Wi-Fi data, because uh, when the girls lose connections, it kind of fits with the whole getting lost after the Caldera, rather than them being in Boquete with the cab drivers in somebody's car. When it comes to the witnesses, according to the book, most of them were only interviewed by the police starting from April the 6th, meaning almost a week after the disappearance. The eyewitness testimonies, of course, are going to be skewed if you interview somebody days after they're supposed to remember something. That is why we had the earlier and the later timeline to begin with. As I mentioned in part one, it was later established that the earlier timeline is more correct based off of the witness statements corroborating that timeline being mostly by the people that knew the women. There were also the Dutch boys that Chris and Lisan became friends with in Bocas that were kind of suspected for a short while as well, but then they were taken off the list. These boys, for some reason, I don't know if they went to Boquete with them as well, it's not really clarified in my sources, but they were also questioned by the Dutch police and nothing really came from that interview. These boys apparently met the girls because on the day Chris and Lisan went to Boquete, they took the bus to Panama City to fly back home. And they were also interviewed by the Dutch police and no substantiated information was ever gotten from this interview. Something that came out of the witness statements was multiple sightings of the red truck. So according to the book, this has been looked into. They actually have full two paragraphs on it, okay? So considering that on certain items and plots in this story where there's literally like one line you got to think like oh wow on something they seem to have done their due diligence again okay, some of you are going to take this apart because i know juan has a whole google drive and there's like hundreds <laughs> okay no, maybe not hundreds but there's a picture of every single possibility for that red truck i don't know who did this but some of you internet sleuths are actually to be feared and respected because there are people that have taken pictures of every single red vehicle in that area being like this is it suspect it analyze it have you seen it between the first and the 11th well 
On April the 11th, several residents of the Pianista Trail stated that on April the 1st and the 3rd, they saw the red pickup truck with four occupants driving by, sort of both up and down the street. This meant that on April the 15th, the police will send out instructions to locate the vehicle. This would lead to an anonymous witness report stating that it was a wine-red Toyota pickup with the license plate number that they have given, and this enabled the police to track down the car and to question its owner. The owner, they confirmed, was this rental company in Boquete, which rented out the car to the Boquete Coffee and Flower Fair, the car was used to pick up flowers and plants from a local farmer, and on April the 22nd, police tracked down the driver. That driver would then give them information that on April the 1st and Thursday, April the 3rd, he had driven up the Pianista to get flowers and plants. He would say that he had three other workers from the neighborhood, he had three other passengers that were seen in the back of the truck, this is confirmed both by the manager of the coffee and flower fair, as well as the lesser of the Toyota, and it was also supported by the rental contracts. To wrap up on the witnesses and their statements, I'm just gonna post a screenshot on the screen from the book that gives you the idea of the earlier and the later timelines for you to take it apart, tell me what you think about it. The person that I haven't looked into because I haven't seen her as a popular suspect was Ingrid. So if you have the tea, if you have the dirt, I know that she has posted multiple Facebook posts during the times when they were searching for the girls. I don't know if she was hiding anything, I don't really know much on Ingrid because she just isn't ever among like top five people that somebody suspects, and also because she wasn't there from what I remember. Then Eileen, do we know for sure that she left the country five days after the second? Is that supported by anything, by any statements? Do we have any statements that she had given to the police? Gaps and holes in this part of the story are most obviously the alibis. Where were any of these people on the first? Where were they on the days that the backpack was found, the days that the remains were found? We know where some of them were, and that is what makes them suspicious, but, you know, why were they there? Do we have supported evidence that the Dutch representatives paid them to be there, or do we not? And then did they pay them for other days, or did they just, again, volunteer over and over again? Were their properties ever raided? Laureano once, again, I couldn't find much when I googled his name, because the whole world focuses on Guide F, but if you look at the maps, and where, like, the rucksack and certain bones were found, Laureano's finca is literally right there, if I remember from the map. So I was like, okay, that would be the most logical conclusion, if we are looking for the dumbest, and also the closest, farm, where the girls might have gone to and then foul play occurred, but I don't see that he was really looked into in a deeper way. Were all of their coffee farms fincas raided? Files from the school that were taken, what do we have on those? Does anybody have any data on them? Before we move on to part four, and before we go on to the theories, I just wanted to share something, I'll share it in the description box. It is on Chris's website, The Imperfect Plan, and it is on mapping the areas, because I genuinely think if we ever are to come to the bottom of this, for all of the people believing in foul play, we do need some more scientific evidence. We do need experts on water currents. We do need people to collect soil from the places where the remains were actually found to see if they match, like, to confirm something that can be factual. And I think that whatever you believe, even if you buy 300%, this was not an accident. The girls would have never gotten lost, they would have never even backtracked, like, the trails are marked so perfectly. We kind of do need more clear markings in certain areas based off of all of the videos that I'm gonna play in this part, and then the next one, and Chris is apparently looking for funding in order to do just that. This, in turn, would help pinpoint important landmarks, identify these different dangerous areas for the tourists, so that this doesn't 
happened to anybody else. And also it would help us understand maybe where the girls would have ended up in. So check that out in the description box if you would like to fund any of his projects. I don't have any affiliation to him, I just use him for research, like him and other blogs, and I found them like extremely helpful. It is clearly why we are here, and why I'm even able to give you this much information on the case. So, also, I would like to never talk about a case like this again. And that is mostly why. And also, if you know anything about water currents, I know that he has done like a proper blog post on that, and we are going to speak about that in a bit more detail in terms of theories. But also, he is looking for people who are familiar with it, you know, when it comes to temperature changes, when it comes to different weather conditions, the Swollen River, as Betsy here called it. So hit him up, because he probably already has been contacted by multiple people, and also would then have the resources to write up more about that. According to the words of one of the wise commentators of one of my last videos, Sean, I simply could not resist. He got it out of a series or a movie. I didn't really Google it. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. But according to his wise words and somebody else's, in life, it's not which path you take, it's whose path you cross. Whether or not you believe that statement, join me for the conclusion of Chris and Lisanne's saga for part four and all of the theories that we are going to speak about then. I thought you said this was not going to be a two hour long video and something, the fact that my ass is like numb, tells me that it might be. And the fact that I have kind of deteriorated in state, if that was somehow possible, also tells me that it might be. Okay, so if I'm alive and well tomorrow, not to be dramatic, but if I'm okay, I'm gonna record part four and then release both of them on the same day, and if not, I'm gonna let you know in the comments. Well, not if, you know, they know you will be okay. Shut the fuck, you dramatic little bitch. Anyways, I am gonna go and escort myself out of this video now, and I shall be seeing you in part four. And then onwards, hopefully, you stick around for other videos that aren't on the mysterious death. Bye, guys. God, your nose is, like, somehow even bigger. I thought that was never possible. Okay, too dramatic.